Week one of the NFL season is officially in the books and there was a lot that happened over the past few days. We saw the NFL debuts of the 2024 NFL Draft class and guys like Joe Alt, Malik Neighbors, and Jaden Daniels all had solid debuts. But it was not all fun and games for every team in week one, and in fact, there were several teams that disappointed in the first week of the season. Just because a team starts out 0-1 does not mean it's the end of the world and we might as well pack it up after playing just 60 minutes of football. But based on the expectations heading into the season, there were a handful of teams that severely disappointed relative to where those expectations were. Some of the teams we're going to discuss in today's video, internally at least, think they're headed for a Super Bowl, but looked anything but Super Bowl contenders in Week 1. And in today's video, we're going to break down the biggest losers of the NFL season so far. We're going to break down what happened in Week 1, what's next for these teams, and if they can play their way out of what was a nightmare scenario to start the year. Now let's begin. And we are starting today's video by breaking down the New York Giants. They lost in the opener to the Minnesota Vikings, and this game was about as bad as you can get, and I'm not asking Daniel Jones to try and challenge that in Week 2 or any game moving forward. Daniel played terrible in this game, and he looked very uncomfortable, and this team only had 240 yards of offense. To make matters worse, they lost 28-6, but on the Vikings' first drive of the game, fullback CJ Ham fumbled and gave the Giants the ball on the Vikings' 20-yard line to start. They only got a field goal out of this, and if they weren't basically handed a free three points, although it was a great defensive play, but the point is, if they didn't start at the 20-yard line to begin with, it would have been an even uglier loss, and this was in a game in which they looked terrible already. Now, I don't want this to be a couple of minute portion of the video of just saying how bad Daniel Jones was in this game, but the run game did not do this team any favors either. I was always concerned with the Giants heading into the season because, for me, it boiled down to one big question. And that question was, can Daniel Jones and Devin Singletary as a quarterback and running back duo legitimately lead an offense in 2024, regardless of how good or bad an offensive line is? And to make matters worse, the Giants offensive line played bad in this game, but the answer to the question of Daniel Jones and Devin Singletary, to me, was always going to be a resounding no. Heading into the year, I was hoping they could be somewhere in the 20-24 to 24 range in terms of points per game and yards per game offensively, and they still can get there, don't get me wrong, as there was a lot of bad offense being played across the league in Week 1, but I have a lot of concerns with this organization moving forward. When you factor in that the Giants are going to have to play the Cowboys and Eagles twice, and when you factor in four of their next six games are against the Cowboys, Seahawks, Bengals, and Eagles, I don't think a 1-5 in five start is unrealistic. And I'm not trying to overreact to what we saw in Week 1, and I'm definitely not saying this team is going 0-17, but from where this team was entering the year, you know, from what we knew about this team before the Vikings game was played, how many of those games would you have honestly thought the Giants would win? And if they start 1-5, or even 2-4 for that matter, which still obviously is not good, does anybody actually think they're going to win 8 of their final 11 games to finish the year 10-7 and and make the playoffs? I don't, and booing your quarterback as he's leaving the stadium and burning his jersey in the parking lot after the game shows where this fanbase thinks they are. This was a nightmare of a week 1 for the Giants. Now, I don't think Sam Darnold is going to be as bad as what we saw throughout the early parts of his career with the Jets, but he started the game 12 of 12 and looked like a really solid player throughout parts of this game. I was also disappointed with the edge duo of Brian Burns and Kayvon Thibodeau, and I really think Dexter Lawrence saved this game from being a hell of a lot worse. Dexter is a freak, but he can only do so much, and when your quarterback looks like he does not have any confidence, and when he plays behind an offensive line that doesn't look good, it's going to be a long year. Positively, I did enjoy when Malik Neighbors got the football, and as simple as it sounds, just get him the rock. From the Big Apple to the Queen City we go to have a conversation about the Carolina Panthers. This was a nightmare of a week one all the way around. Usually you can say, well, at least X or Y player did this, and we can build on that moving forward. But this was awful. I don't think the Saints are going to go to the Super Bowl this year, and I don't think many people do, and I think that's what makes this loss a hundred times worse. This was supposed to be a new beginning. Everyone was okay with tossing out the 2023 season and chalking it up to Frank Reich not being a good head coach, and the Panthers setting Bryce Young up to fail. 
and they certainly did in 2023 as he was sacked over 60 times and his receiving core was bad and he did not have a chance. But bringing in Dave Canales to be the team's head coach and bringing in guys like Deontay Johnson and Robert Hunt and Damian Lewis and even a bounce back year from former top six pick Ika McQuanu. But nothing went right, and I mean nothing. Bryce Young was pressured on nearly 40% of his dropbacks, he did not look comfortable, and he looked like a deer in headlights. All game long. He completed just 13 of 30 passes, threw for just 161 yards, and also threw two interceptions. The interception he threw on the very first play of the game summarized what type of day it was going to be for him and the Panthers. To make matters worse, the pass was intended for Deontay Johnson, and when the ball went by him, it was so far over his head and out in front of him that you can see on tape, he kind of looked where the ball went and it was almost like you could see him think, wait, is, is this pass intended for me? And I wouldn't be so upset with the Panthers after one game if they lost 24-20 and the Panthers were driving down the field and Bryce threw an interception trying to make a play with the game on the line. But this wasn't even close. The other interception was just a blatant overthrow intended for Adam Thielen. The run game was also terrible as they averaged just 2.9 yards per carry on the day, and why I am so upset with this team is there was supposed to be improvements, and that's the bottom line. When this game was being played, it was like, oh okay, the Saints are up 10-0 5 minutes in. Oh, now they're up 17-0. Oh, now it's 30-0, before ballooning all the way to 37-3 at a point. I will credit the Panthers front office for going out and making things happen this offseason and for spending over $150 million to bring in Damian Lewis and Robert Hunt to try and attempt to help their young quarterback, but Bryce was under pressure a lot and he also looked awful in this game. And the player Bryce Young was at Alabama is nowhere close to the Bryce Young we saw in 2023 or now in week one of 2024. I'm not entirely out on Bryce and the Panthers, and I don't want this to be a, well, we're done already and move on because it was only one game, and every team will play a bad game in 2024, but the leash on how far I'm willing to be optimistic with this team definitely shortened. I thought the Panthers were going to lose this game, but not by 37 points, and not by starting the game out by spotting the Saints 30. And I think what adds on to how bad of a game this was for Carolina was the Saints are probably not a Super Bowl team. This was not the 85 Bears out there eating Bryce Young alive. And this is about as ugly of a situation as you're going to find. Cleveland lost their home opener with a score of 33-17, and I know a 16-point loss obviously isn't good, but this game was a lot further apart than even a 16-point loss. It was a beatdown, and the Browns scored a touchdown with 30 seconds left to slightly cushion how bad of a game this was. Deshaun Watson was sacked six times, he did not look comfortable in this game, and it showed. Now, I do think this was a combination of a really good Cowboys defense, along with a bad quarterback leading Cleveland's offense, but the results were terrible. And the reason why Cleveland is one of the biggest losers to start the 2024 season is due in large part to the situation around their quarterback. Obviously, we know all about the trade to go get Deshaun Watson, which occurred a couple of years ago, but they let go of Baker Mayfield to make this happen, and the gamble certainly has not paid off for Cleveland. I was willing to let the 2022 season go when Deshaun came back for the Browns, simply because of how long it had been since he played football at the NFL level, and I do believe if any of the premier quarterbacks took nearly two full years off in their prime, well, I would expect there to be a lot of rust, which there was for Deshaun at the end of the 2022 season. I also do not think he looked good during the time he played in 2023, outside of one half against the Ravens. And the problem with that was having a full offseason go by, banking on the fact that a player who has played one good half of football in the past three years could somehow be that guy on a down-to-down -down basis. And that's a big problem because that is setting him up to fail. And Deshaun finishing the day 24 of 45 for 169 yards with one touchdown and two interceptions is who he is at this point in his career. He doesn't see guys get open, he doesn't hit the NFL open passes when he should, and the financial implications of this trade are significant. Fully guaranteeing him $230 million set this franchise back several years because of where they are now. And I think it's extremely unfortunate for every player on this defense because of how good of a unit this is. And for any Browns fans out there that still want to believe in Deshaun Watson moving forward, and the ones that are holding on to any sliver of hope they may have, 
I don't think both tackles being out in week one is going to change things all that much. Is Jedrick Wills playing going to help Deshaun read Amari Cooper being wide open on a dagger route on third and eight when Deshaun willingly chooses to roll out of a clean pocket and force himself into a tough throw? Is even a prime Joe Thomas going to help Deshaun read the defense? No, and that's the problem. It also doesn't help the Browns are in a very tough division and that this division is notorious for playing great defense and being tough to score on because that's only going to magnify the problem from a national media standpoint. Amari Cooper and Jerry Judy had a combined 17 targets in week one and together they hauled in just five receptions for 41 yards. Together they had a catch percentage of just 29.4%. Cleveland's next few games are against the Jags, Giants, Raiders, and Commanders, and all of those games are winnable, but even if they start out 3-2 or 4-1 because their defense held each team to 13 or 14 points apiece, that won't change the glaring $230 million problem they have. Can Deshaun get out of this? I mean, I guess technically yes, but I would be absolutely shocked if he did, and the outlook of this team looks very bleak. The Atlanta Falcons are next, and it's more than just the simple fact that they only put up 10 points after paying a quarterback a lot of money. The Falcons are on here for several reasons and the potential implications after their Week 1 loss to the Steelers. The Falcons threw the ball 26 times in Week 1, and out of those 26 passing attempts, Kirk Cousins had zero attempts come from play action. Now, whatever you think of Kirk when he's healthy, whether he's great, whether he's good but not great, whatever the case may be, Kirk is a solid quarterback and he does well off of play action like a lot of quarterbacks do, but Kirk's completion percentage off of play action is actually in the upper echelon of the NFL and that's a really big part of his game. Now, the reason why I included the Falcons in this is because they didn't run any play action, which is obviously a benefit to Cousins game. And one of the reasons that I think they didn't run play action is because I don't think they trust where he is physically. And you could see that during the Falcon Steelers game where Kirk was not throwing with the same velocity that he had last year in Minnesota and not just in 2023, but in any of the past four or five seasons, the velocity was not there from Kirk. And we obviously all knew that Kirk tore his Achilles last year and this team still proceeded to give him a four-year, $180 million contract. Now, one thing that I will kind of ease Falcons fans' concerns on is this was never going to be a four-year contract. Let's just go ahead and let's just at least get that elephant out of the room. Kirk Cousins' cap hits in 26 and 27 are scheduled to be $57.5 million, and the guarantees are what matters. Kirk was guaranteed between 90 and 100 million, so he was never going to play that contract out, and at that point, Michael Penix would take over, presumably at the start of 2026, but I gotta be honest, I don't think we're going to get there. The Kirk Cousins we saw in week one was a lot different than the Kirk Cousins we saw last year, and when you factor in that he's already not a mobile quarterback, and the fact that they simply do not trust him to run play action because they do not trust him to be able to roll out to Bijan and then come back all in one motion and, and to make the play action play, or to at least have the mobility to run a play action play before the, th the pass is even thrown. Guys, I think this is a very, very serious situation here in Atlanta because what are they going to do? And I think we're at a point where they play Philly in week two, they play Kansas City in week three, and then they have back-to-back -back division games with the Saints and Bucks in weeks four and five. And unfortunately for the Falcons and their fan base, both the Saints and Bucks looked phenomenal in week one, and especially Tampa. I mean, Baker threw for four touchdowns, he played great, and he played pretty close to an MVP level in that game. I mean, he looked phenomenal. And... Here we are in Atlanta with Kirk Cousins, a guy that we just spent $180 million for, and a guy that looked absolutely nothing like the player we were going to get, and a guy that looked absolutely uncomfortable all game, and the question is, what are they going to do? Now, just being honest, I don't think they're going to start 0-5, but I do think they're going to start 0-3, and we're in a position now where we have a 36-year-old quarterback coming off of a torn Achilles, and he doesn't look anywhere close to the player that he was. So when you factor in that GM Terry Fontenot is in a now or never year because he stayed while Arthur Smith was fired and he made the decision to go out and get Kirk Cousins and the fact that they have him to such a high contract because Kirk will not get cut until after the 2025 season unless the Falcons want to go the Broncos route which they did with Russell Wilson and eat all that money in one season and that's 
probably not the route they want to go because the Falcons internally think that they are going to be able to win the division and that they're going to be able to win at least one playoff game if not multiple playoff games and if you have a 50 or 60 million dollar dead cap hit from Kirk Cousins which is what it would be next year that's going to obviously hinder the franchise the way that it's going to hinder the Broncos this year. I would love to be proven wrong, but Kirk was a statue of statues back there in the pocket. Kyle Pitts and Drake London combined for five catches for 41 yards in a season and in a game where everyone thought that they could break out, and now that they're finally gone from the Mariotas and Ritters of the, and the Heinekes of the world, but it was awful in week one and I have a lot of concerns with the Falcons moving forward because I really do think they're going to start out 0-3. The Titans are also applicable for today's video given that they blew a 17 point lead without allowing a single offensive touchdown and that was a horrific loss and Brian Callahan after the game said that they probably would have been better punting the ball on first and 10 rather than having an offensive series, and I think that is potential red flags as well moving forward. I hope you enjoyed today's video, and if you did, please like and subscribe, as only about 30% of people watching are subscribed, and helps the channel tremendously. Until next time, please be safe, and have a great day. Love you guys.